Okay, so in March um, 2021, Head of Data and Digital Preservation, Stephen McConaughey, made a tough decision to decommission our existing media asset management system, um, or MAM, and build our own custom replacement for this. My role was to build all the back-end tooling for the project um, using Python. Um, with Stephen's experience and guidance, um, as I'd only really been in post six months when he decided to do this, um, his, his overview of it, his understanding of it, and his assistance was really essential. So where, are me where was our media asset management uh, system positioned, and what did it do? Um, across 20 network shares, we have automated ingest folders, where newly created files are placed once they have been manually or automatically documented in our Axial Collections ad libs collection management system which the BFI National Archive call uh, Collections Information Database, or SID for short. So SID records have been made of the files. The files have been captured, digitized, converted into their long-term preservation formats, um, and they've been named after their object number from the SID item record. When our colleagues have created these, then they are renamed uh, manually and placed into um, the auto-ingest folders, um, which then it executes a validation check against the file. So we have um, many paths for this. We've got DPX encoding, off-air TV recording. Um, these are all moved in automated through automated processes. But then we have more manual processes that also feed into these. Um, first thing that the Python script checks, we've got some scripting originally. Sorry, it was um, auto-ingest scripting that was written by Edward Anderson that was written in legacy Python 2 code, it would validate the files once they made their way into the auto-ingest folder subsystems. Um, and it would check a few vitals. Um, so like the name was formatted correctly, that the item linked correctly to a SID item record, uh, that the file type was recognized from the extension, and that it matches the SID item record, and that the file hadn't already been ingested, so it would run a check for that. Um, and that the item is being ingested in its correct order. So a one of two is before a two of two and that kind of thing. So once our Python code had finished that validation, um, it would initiate the ingest phase using Imogen's API. Now Imogen is the media asset management system that we look to replace. Ingest would occur one file at a time. So your FFE1 file, for example, would be separately ingested to the WAV file and to the DPX sequence. Um, which would be tar wrapped, by the way. This block sees many integrations between the Imogen Media Asset Management System, the Spectrologic Black Pearl Software Development Kit, or SDK, which is how we write our um, data to the long term tape storage. Um, and it would also integrate with the Python codes in there too, and the Axial SID records. So basically, Python initiated the ingest, which enabled Imogen to move the files to Spectra's black tape, like black pearl tape library, and added the file into a lock, which prevented any further actions um, being taken against it by the Python coding. So the Imogen software provided really useful visualization tools to view how far through ingest the files were, um, which allowed for good throughput analysis by our teams. Once ingested, the legacy Python script uh, persistence.py, which was also written by Edward, would verify for the BFI National Archive that the file had actually made it into the Black Pearl data tape library by comparing a local and um, a remote Black Pearl file. So it would download the Black, um, sorry, download the MD5 checks from, from the Black Pearl and then build a local MD5 checksum as well and ensure that they were identical. Um, it also compared the file sizes as well and then output the successes to our logs. So the next stage, um, now that the files had persisted, it was possible to use Spectra's Black Pearl Eon browser to access and download the files, um, which spoke directly between the Black Pearl tape library and was, has a user interface for individuals to use. Um, it's a bit like a GUI that is not unlike an FTP download software. So the next stage saw Imogen create proxy uh, MP4 HLS video files and proxy audio files and proxy image files for stills um, so that documents or applications um, wouldn't go through this stage, but it meant that we could view those files. When these proxy files were created and linked to the newly created SID media record, generated again by Imogen, 
um, that links it to the SID item record that it represents. Um, at this point, they became viewable to all the BFI staff who had access to our digital preservation infrastructure through Imogen's media asset management software. It had an integrated video and audio viewer within it and also some useful video editing software. So the final stage would be then for our own Python scripts to read the persistence checks, um, knowing that those checksums matched and that the file had persisted successfully. It would then look to see that all of the transcoding had finished by the removal of that lock state on the file. And at this point, this point only, our own Python 2 scripts would delete the original asset, knowing that there was a valid copy. So um, now our system looks... OK. Some notes there that I don't need. So to summarize Imogen's involvement in this workflow, um, it would supply ingest confirmation to Axial's AdLib SID records and also create digital media records within our SID database that confirmed a digital file had persisted to Spectra's tape library. Next, Imogen managed creation of proxy MP4, HLS, audio and JPEG thumbnails and fed back the names of those into the SID digital media record. Imogen would then communicate directly to the tape storage, Spectra's Black Pearl S3 as a native HTTP-based interface to our long-term storage. It enables easy archiving of data to tape library, and it also offers extra services where you can write to servers or to cloud solutions as well. But we just use the tape library as far as I'm aware. It has a REST-based HTTP API. Um, an API is an application programming interface. Um, that allows client software to manage bulk storage, read, write, and delete operations. However, Imogen um, limited our write to magnetic tape libraries to a one per file, at, one file at a time basis, um, using the connection it had with Spectra's S3 software, um, which provided pretty easy communications between the two. The problem is uh, that we could only send one file at a time, so the image into Spectra integration was in increasingly unable to meet the demands in our growing ingest workflows, such as our 100,000 videotapes. This was um, also probably a consequence of our ongoing videotape off-air TV recording systems, which create about 500 MPEG TS video files a day, and an increase as well from 2K to 4K film transcoding with our raw cook pipelines too, which just makes much larger files. So with Imogen removed, we now have a lot of space. Um, and this is kind of how things are organized today. Um, what's happened? Is there a color background coming there? OK. So we deprecated the script called persistence.py. Um, and it's been replaced by some of the new coding. Um, the ingest persistence and access copy creation are now all managed by Python 3 scripts, which I've built. Also, the validation and delete scripts um, in auto-ingest.py, auto -ingest which was Edward's Python 2 script, have been refactored and moved into Python 3. The scripts now all deal directly with the Axial API, um, so creating and updating SID item and digital media records, and also the Python scripts speak directly to the Black Pearl um, SDK. So we can write our own tapes, our own information to um, bulk ingest in the tape libraries. We lost Imogen's progress reporting, unfortunately, but Stephen um, quickly built an Elasticsearch log monitor with a Kibana visualization tool that lets us view ingested files by file type, by date period, by groupings, etc. This is um, our ingest for 2023. 28,000 files were ingested in January, with the majority being MPEG uh, transport streams from our off-air TV recording. It breaks the collections down into groups in the top right, um, genres and subjects below that. This can't report on problems with ingests, but we have an error reporting feature implemented in our logging that gives auto-ingest users that feedback. So I hope... Um, to move our scripts into Apache Airflow scheduling and monitoring platform at some point in the near future, which would also give us um, a more granular error reporting via a web UI um, format, making it easier for the data and digital preservation team as a whole to monitor the script activities that are going on across all of the servers. Um, we're also aware since this is, that this has been set up that Elasticsearch is now um, no longer an open source tool, sadly. But I believe it was when this was first written 
but I just thought I'd add that here. So we recently lost functionality of the Eon browser downloader, which Spectra Logic um, supported. Uh, so instead, with Stephen's help, I built a Python flash, uh, Flask web app um, UI to allow BFI staff with access to DPI to download direct files, direct um, files from the Black Pearl to folders of their choice. The first version was built using SQLite um, with a SQL database, and a later version that's just been completed uses the Elasticsearch again, which allows integration with the DPI browser, which is the final phase of our replacement of the Imogen project. Um, it's being built at the moment by colleagues in technical and digital transformation at the BFI um, who are ensuring authenticated access to all the DPI collections. And their web interface will provide replacement for the video player that Imogen used to supply and also link to the DPI downloader functionality which I built as part of the, that web interface. I should add that while Imogen, when Imogen was taken down in 2021, Stephen quickly put together um, a temporary stand-in video player which used, I think, Nginx to stream HLS videos and also implemented the IIIF um, image viewer as well for viewing image collections. So we haven't been without an option for viewing things. So this new Python code is what I want to look at more closely next. I'm thrilled to say we've just open sourced all of this code to our latest GitHub repository, which you can see here, the BFI underscore scripts. It works, um, it's work in progress, so it's still being kind of moved over at the moment and descriptions are being changed in the readme quite continually. Um, I wanna thank the BFI National Archive for allowing us to make all our code available. Not everybody's that brave really, um, but it does, um, align with our screen archives of the future 2033 strategic goal to be the world's most open, open and accessible archive. So it's wonderful to have that support um, to open source our codes at this stage. So there's six kind of main scripts that we have that replace that media asset management system. Um, and they carry out the bulk of the DPI workload. It's, um, it's a lot more code, so bear with me as I go through it. To begin with, it's good to just give you an overview of where all of these scripts kind of interact on all the different servers across um, st storage across the BFI. We have like an auto ingest folder where the media asset management used to, tool used to work within this auto ingest folder and it's had some developments in there recently and there's extra folders have been added in. But this is the layout for our auto ingest folder shares in all of the storage. There's an auto detect folder. Well, there's an ingest folder really where people put the files initially in the ingest folder is an auto detect folder which will accept any file format and process that. But there are also more specific subfolders for people who want to put them into video specific or image specific or proxy folders. They have a current errors folder which contains that error reporting that I mentioned earlier. It has a CSV with each day's errors listed in there and a description of what the error might be. And then the three orange folders are where my new automation scripts work. So from the ingest folders, files are moved into the black pearl ingest folder, um, subfolder, and then when ingest is completed, they're moved to the transcode folder where the proxy copies are made, and then when proxy transcoding is finished, they're moved into the completed folder where the auto ingest script picks them up for deletion. So um, this is our auto ingest Python 3 script with some changes that have been implemented since um, it was created by Edward. Collects, uh, it collects up all the log messages for files in scope for processing. So it, it doesn't look on a file by file basis. It goes through the logs to find files that are still not completed. And it works through the logs to actually access um, the files with on, the, on the servers. Um, it then iterates all the auto ingest folders and searches within each path, um, within the completed path and within the ingest paths. Um, if it finds files within the completed path, then it checks the logs for persistent confirmation, and if it finds that persistence confirmation, which means that those two checksums match between the um, black pearl and the local MD5, then it just deletes the file. Um, and it excludes incorrect file paths or file names from processing. So if it comes across any files that have been put into the ingest folder, for example, that haven't been finished or named correctly, then it won't process those. It leaves them in place and puts an error into that current errors folder. Um, it has some nice uh, regular expression work in it, which I inherited from Edward. Um, the first tier is in the check file name, so it uses regular expressions or rejects, I call it, um, 
to s in this um, function here to search for just file names that have uppercase and lowercase letters in them or underscores or numbers, I believe. And if there's anything else, um, then the file name is rejected. There's also some rejects in the check part whole script, which is looking for a match of two to four consecutive numbers separated by an of um, and another two to four consecutive numbers. This is our part whole, which um, we use throughout all of our file naming protocols so that we know if there's multiple reels, for example, of a film DPX that's been scanned, 01 of 03, 02 of 03, 03 of 03. Um, a later check examines the extension of the file name that's been put into the auto ingest folder, ingest folders, to check that the file extension matches an agreed dictionary of accepted file formats at the BFI. So if this script finds a .mxf, then the file type in the um, associated item record can either be an MXF or it can be an IMP now as well, because we've just expanded to accept the interoperable master format package, which we're receiving from Netflix. So the checks continue with SID media record checks to make sure that the file hasn't been ingested already. Um, and again, we check Black Pearl to make sure that there's no file on the Black Pearl with the same name. It's all belts and braces checks, really, just to stop us getting duplicates written to tape. Uh, because we recently started ingesting Netflix files to Black Pearl Tape Library, we've separated our buckets so that BFI preservation bucket content is all stored in one bucket and Netflix is stored in another bucket. So quite frequently throughout these scripts, you'll see a reference to Netflix looking to ensure that we're making sure that we're checking in the right bucket and we're pushing files to the right bucket as well, separations. So the next stage looks at whether the code is next in line for ingest or whether it's part um, within its part whole group. So for example, if 02 of 04 is placed into an ingest folder before 01 of 04, then um, 02 of 04 won't progress until 01 of 04 has progressed. Um, this is the usual practice for all of our ingests, except when we have film scans where we have a, a folder called um, incomplete scans. And quite often with film scanning, they'll just re-scan one particular part of a reel. It might not be the first part, and they'll need to ingest that at a later date. So they have an incomplete scans path, which will accept any part whole ordering. If any 01 of 01 um, turn up or any 01 of 02 parts, then they immediately get put through for ingest without question. But any later parts have to have the checks made against them. So before ingest is confirmed, um, Two final checks are performed. One looks to check the downtime control JSON, which I mentioned, to make sure that the do ingest flag is set to true and that the auto ingest scripts are set to true in case we want to just prevent ingest for any time and allow deletions to happen. Um, the second check is that the full size of the file being ingested is under one terabyte in size. We're currently not able to ingest files over one terabyte, um, which is the maximum size allowed by Spectra's Black Pearl for a single blob of data in its storage. If we exceed this limit, then we can't run a whole checksum file against, checksum check against that file. Um, so it, it kind of breaks our persistence checks as they stand at the moment. So we try to keep all of our ingest under one terabyte at this time. When all these checks have passed, then the file is moved out of the ingest subfolder into the black pearl ingest folder and then the next scripts pick it up. So this is the script that manages the write of the ingest files um, moved into that black pearl ingest folder. It's called black pearl move put. They're not very inventive names I have to say. My names are usually quite, you know, <laughs> quite specific and a bit obvious but that's a good thing in coding. Um, so what this does in a different way to Imogen is it um, allows for a buildup of files to be collected into a black pearl ingest folder and it allows us to put up to one terabyte or two terabyte groups of files to the black pearl tape um, library at any given time, which allows us far bigger throughput of files. I think in the Imogen era, I need to double check with you, Lucy, I think it was we were seeing one terabyte maximum ingests a week one to three terabytes a week. Um, but now in this modern era of putting direct, we're seeing, I think, seven to 10 put, um, terabytes of put per week, with some exceptions that have gone up into the 20s, I think. 
seven to 10 terabytes a day. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so that's really why it was essential for us to replace the image and put option, because now we can get a one week's worth of ingest in a day, basically. Um, so this one script is launched multiple times from each of our auto ingest shares. Um, it's using um, sysarg to capture that launch from a shell script. Um, and then one file path is supplied to the script. Any, um, no, that's not correct. This one script is launched multiple times from each share, and the share is passed in as a sysarg from the crontab launch. So it's receiving the actual auto ingest path from the launch. Here you can see all the different shares in that large block. Um, the script user is listed, then the flock lock, which protects the scripts from launching multiple times, is also in that list, um, second piece along. Um, we call the Python script using the py3env um, environmental variable, which is the environmental, um, which is the virtual environment that's installed into the servers, which we install all of our Python dependencies into to protect the bigger ecosystem of the whole server. Um, and then following that is the name of the script that we launch. And then after that, you can see in, bra in, um, co in comment comments, um, the, file, the name of the actual server that the auto ingest file is on. So GRAC 47, F47, for example, at the top there. The last bit is capturing all the standard out and errors to a Python log, um, which is overwritten each time the script runs, but it's there as a fail safe to catch any errors in the code if a problem comes up. So the script separates out the Netflix paths at this point, as we mentioned earlier, um, to ensure that the correct data is being supplied into the correct buckets and that we have that separation. The remaining paths are checked against an ingest config YAML to see what their maximum ingest folders should be. So we have um, a YAML document with the path, with the auto ingest share in there. And on a, on a storage by storage basis, we've kind of adjusted what our max, maximum puts are. Generally, it's one terabyte blocks that we, we work with, but on some of our older QNAPs, we've upped that to two terabytes where there's a lot of files being generated just to save a lot of IO communications. Um, so, And for one, we have a, a rapid ingest, so I think we've just got like 200 megabytes on that one, so any file that's added into it is immediately put for urgent um, updates. So a few checks uh, follow to ensure that the paths are present. Um, so that means that the auto ingest path can be found. You'd only lose that if a mount was dropped from the server that the script is running from. Um, and then there's a few auto ingest, black pull ingest path checks. They're saved into two variables um, in the folders, so they make sure that the file that they're finding within the folder is guaranteed an actual file and that they separate them into, oh, there we go, no, I'm looking at the bottom. Okay, so at that point, once we are inside the auto ingest folder, we build up a list of files within that black pearl ingest folder and a list of folders within that black pearl ingest folder. We'll see why in the next section. So next, the script moves to process folders first where no files have been found in the auto ingest path, which means there are no files to move into the ingest folder. It only wants to deal with the ingest folders at this point, so it does a starts with check to make sure that the file starts with ingest. So extracting the folder name to its own variable, the script checks how old the folder is by extracting date and time from the folder name. So every ingest folder when it's created is given the name ingest underscore and then the, the date of the moment that it's made and the time of the moment that it's made. It uses the check folder age function to see how old that folder is. So if it was made in the last day or, or two days, um, the date string is converted into a date time object and compared against the time now. The put scripts don't automatically push files to the black pearl tape library. If there's not enough files moved into a new ingest folder or an existing ingest folder that's not a day old, then they, and they don't collectively meet that upload size of, 20, of one terabyte, for example, then the folder's left for the next pass to see if more files can be added, um, but only up to one 24 hour period. So when it checks that time, if the time is older than a day old, then the ingest folder is immediately put to the Black Pearl um, Spectrologic SDK using the put dir function. It should be showing now. Um, so we use the software development kit, the SDK, and they've got classes in there that are useful for really simple, easy 
um, interactions with it. So we use the helper class, put all objects in directory. So that allows us to push a whole directory full of items straight to the Blackpool tape library all in one hit. When it completes that process, the SDK will return a job ID for that job. Um, so the job ID is then um, used to name the, rename the ingest folder so that we have a changeover in the folder that shows that it's been put to the um, Black Pearl library. Um, to create that JSON file, we use a different class here, the SDK client module, put job completed notification registration spectra S3, <laughs> which is a long one. Um, and that sends a notification to a Flask app that um, Stephen McConaughey built um, a little while ago. And that's this bit of code here. I've not added this to our repository yet, but I will soon. Um, we have it running continually on our server to catch these notifications, convert them into a JSON file, and dump them into our Black Pearl folder um, on our Isilon storage. It runs on our local server IP, and it uses port 5000, as you can see at the bottom. So again, if the file is under one day old, then it gets left there. Um, files can be continually added to it until it becomes a day old or until it exceeds its upload size. Um, finally, the script checks for population of the job ID, um, the job list, sorry, and if so, it renames the folder, as I just explained from that ingest, um, but it's renamed to the job ID. So it does this using the path rename function. Um, first, it checks if the job was split into more than one job. I've never seen it, but I've factored it into the code to make sure that we're covered in case more than one IG job ID is returned, for example, if it's split. Um, so it checks multiples and then builds that folder name from those multiples. Okay. So now we'll look at what happens when the files are found. Um, it launches a while loop. So this is um, the first example we just saw was when there are no files in the folder and we're just dealing with the ingest folder. Now we've got files within the Black Pearl ingest folder and this is the loop that handles putting those files into an ingest folder. So it refreshes the folders variable to make sure that the list of folders in that Black Pearl ingest folder is as up to date as possible. It then iterates through that folder looking for any existing ingest folders. Um, the script checks how large the contents of that folder is and saves um, that into a variable called f size. And it uses this sum to iterate all the contents of a folder and add them into a final byte value. If this folder is under that one terabyte limit, um, then more files are added into that um, ingest folder until it reaches that one terabyte list. Um, which is happening in, yeah, this script here. Okay. Um, if smaller, then the file is, okay. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to read through this, so I apologize. I'm just going to look at the screen. So the move to ingest folder, okay, this starts moving all of the files into the ingest folder and checking the um, status of the Black Pearl file, of the file first to make sure it's not already been ingested into Black Pearl. There's always the risk, I think, that when you have folders that are in all the shares that people might accidentally move files into the wrong folders. So we like to make sure that Black Pearl doesn't have a version already on there. If it does, it just skips the folder. Um, then it checks the folder size after if it's moved the fold, um, to check it's not yet over the upload size. If it's not, it moves the file into that folder and then it keeps looping through that um, until that's completed. We also have the check BP status there. That's where it checks using the head object request for the SDK. Okay. So we have another folder size check. There's lots of folder size checks. I think when I refactor this script, there's lots of work I can do on not getting folder size checks so continually. Um, the folders then push to the Black Pearl library again using the put uh, once it's reached that maximum size. Um, finally, it checks again for the job um, list variable and if it found it renames the folder with the job ID. Um, it also checks if there are any files remaining. So if for example, there's 200 files in the folder and it reached that one terabyte with using just 50 of them. Then it stores the remainder in a files remaining variable 
and that updates the files um, variable, which then informs the while loop to ensure that it keeps running. So it will launch again and then restart the process again, moving files into a new ingest folder. And then the logs are updated and the script exits once it's reached the f working through all of those files. Okay, so I hope that gives you an overview of the put methodology that we use there. Um, the next script is the Black Pearl Validate Make Record script. Um, I'm going to try and whip through this one quite quickly. So unlike the last script, there um, are just two scripts that work for this one. Um, one solely for the off-air TV recording because we have 500 files a day and one for every other path that we have, basically. Um, it checks first for the Netflix path and ensures the auto ingest path variable is correctly named, adding it and all regular paths to the auto ingest list. Then opens and reads the JSON file, um, which lists different bucket names with balls indicating which is the current bucket for writing data into Black Pearl. This is a manually updated JSON that we alter um, as and when we decide we want to start recording, um, moving files into different buckets within our preservation group. We had a bucket recently that got, I think, to 10, bar 10 petabytes. It was very full anyway, so we've decided we're now going to start splitting it across preservation buckets in the future. The script next builds a list of uh, folders found in the auto ingest black pearl ingest folder. If none are found, um, the script moves out to the auto ingest next path, so it moves on to the next path. It then iterates the folder list, and if any folders are found starting with ingest or error, then the skip the script misses them. It's just looking for folders that are named after the job ID or that have a pending prefix on them, which means they've been worked on by this script already, um, but not all of the data has been um, available to finish processing the file. If a folder is found named after its job ID, then the script searches for that max matching JSON file, which you saw earlier, we're collecting from that Flask app and putting into an Iceland Black Pearl um, folder. This is the JSON confirmation created by the Black Pearl SDK notification that's sent to our Flask app. Um, they populate a folder called Black Pearl folder on the Isilon. It opens and reads the JSON to see if any notification is given of a cancellation to that put. Because sometimes when we're writing to the Black Pearl library, something can break the put process and um, it can be canceled part way through. And that cancellation should pass through to this JSON file. It also has a failed file section within that JSON where we are hoping that we'll start seeing, if it happens, the file names of the files that haven't managed to persist the data tape. And this script, ready for that, is extracts that information and will then move those files out of the completed ingest folder so that they can be put back through to a second ingest attempt at a later date. Um, then it launches a very big function called the process files function, um, which manages the persistence checking for the files left in the folder, and it outputs the success of this to a success variable. I'm just going to skip through these because we haven't got a lot of time. So, where are we at? So, yeah, the same process happens again. Da, da, da. We are going to work through the processing file function. So it retrieves the byte size of the file. It gets the duration in seconds and milliseconds. It writes the file name, duration, and size uh, to a CSV, temporarily storing this information for all files with the intention of writing it into the SID digital media record at some point in the future development. That's that one there. It retrieves confirmation to write of write to the Black Pearl remote MD5 and file sizes are retrieved from the Black Pearl SDK. That's one too far, but um, if confirmation of the write to the BP is not confirmed and the write warnings are, are put into the log to warn that a re-ingest is going to be needed, um, it checks the local MD5 has been retrieved from the local storage. So I have separate scripts that are making the MD5 checksums. Um, if no local MD5 has been made yet, then it writes a warning and skips over the file again and then prefixes the folder with the pending warning. Um, it checks the byte size of the local file against the remote one in the Black Pearl. And then the final check is to check if the SID media record has already been created for that file, meaning it's already been through this process and so will have ingested as well. So it's belts and braces again, lots of checks to make sure that we don't get duplicate files written into, um, into Black Pearl and duplicate records created. 
So if all these pass OK, then a persistent message is written to the auto-ingest logs, which basically tells auto-ingest that it can delete the file at a later date. But before that happens, we need to move those files to the transco folder for the MP4 transcoding processes. And I think at that point, I'm going to skip on to the checksum making script. So there's just one version of our checksum maker media info script. So this script um, creates MD5 checksums across all of the auto ingest shares so that the comparisons can occur for the um, local and remote version um, scripting. This was one of the first things we outsourced to our own Python scripts because checksums were taking a long time to generate within the old persistence code that we used to use. So we've now got multiple iterations of the script running at any one given time. This is the shell script is launched multiple times from the cron tab of one of our servers. Um, so it lists the auto ingest paths that it wants to target on the right hand side and that number behind it are the amount of jobs that I want to pass in for that share to the GNU parallel. So it will launch, for example, some have 20 jobs running against them and that's the store off air TV recording and also our Ofcom and Videotape Digitization has 20 parallel processes running against it. Uh, the main script is launched um, against just one of the files, so it just receives that one file path through those jobs that are pushed in. Before it begins its checks, um, before it begins, it checks the checksum folder to make sure that there isn't already a checksum existing for this file because there is the potential for it to hit the same file many times if ingest is a bit slow. It launches the make output MD5 function, um, which in turn launches the MD5 um, 65536 function, which is the amount of bytes that each chunk should feature in the hashlib creation. It uses Python's hashlib library to make the MD5 chunks. Another function writes that checksum into a file and then places it within our checksum local checksum folder. And finally, the file is read by media info and six metadata files are created from the technical metadata of the file as well using media info and are saved into a media info folder as .txt, .xml, .json. And you can see they include EBU, PBCore and a number of others. Um, these are later written into the SID digital media record and kept for long-term storage. So they're, right, they're written as, as they are at the moment into the header data of our records. But at some point in the future, with our premise workflows, we hope to integrate the metadata from these into actual fields within our digital media records. OK, so that's our checksum generation script. Um, the MP4 transcode script which we're on here. Um, this is the script that converts our um, files, audiovisual files, into MP4 files, and also any image files that are supplied into auto and just transcode paths into um, smaller JPEG versions of themselves. Um, it checks a number of things, um, including whether or not the file path is actually one of our Heritage 2022 projects. Um, and it retrieves the input date that the SID digital media record was created. Both of these two pieces of information are used to create the path for the MP4 file so that they can be found later on through our DPI browser. There are checks that the file hasn't already been processed as well, um, just in case there was a move error that didn't move the file out of the transcode folder as it should have done. And, and then it looks for what type of file it is. So it looks for that MIME type again, whether it's an audio, um, video, image, or document. Any audio or document files are immediately moved straight into the completion folder at this point because we can't create proxies for those at the moment. Um, if the file is video, then the following checks are completed. Um, media info again used to retrieve the display aspect ratio, pixel aspect ratio, height, width, and duration data. The MP4 transcode paths are configured from the input date and file name, as I mentioned. Um, and the metadata is then supplied into the create transcode function. So the function separates out all of the different FFmpeg commands into blocks, as you can see there. Um, it's a very long one, this. And in the second block, you can see there are 13 potentially different filter combinations, uh, video filter combinations. 
which are lots of different kind of crop options that we have for SD608, NTSC SD, 4x3, PAL, 60 9 PAL, HD and Ultra HD, and files bigger than UHD as well. Each of these video filters has FFmpeg's black detect within it, you'll see, towards the back end, um, which captures all the start and stop times throughout the transcode where there are black frames found. Um, and it logs the start and stop times, which the Python later extracts into a dictionary of black frames. So it can be used later on to help select a piece of video for the JPEG thumbnail extraction, avoiding those areas of black where, say, a documentary fades to black, for example. So it looks um, to pick actual image and not black areas. It also processes a few different video and audio mappings before making a basic aspect ratio calculation at the bottom, um, which divides the width of the image by the height and rounds that to three decimal points, which it uses later on in the command. Then the final section of the FFmpeg command building script um, runs through a series of potential height and display aspect ratio or height and width or height and par options to best match the video information that's being input into it. And from here it populates um, a variable called command mid. So it's basically selecting which of those 13 um, uh, video filters are the best match for the file that's been supplied into it. And this is a kind of a growing piece of work every now and then particularly from Lucy's digital operations teams, we have another file which doesn't sit within these kind of 13 options. And so it just ends up sitting in the transcode folder for a long time and I have to take a look at it and see where it's not, where it's falling through the gaps, so to speak, in this plan. And then we keep expanding it as we go. Um, so that's the, that then supplies the command back based on whether or not there's audio um, and a couple of other things back into the main script. And once the command's returned, a log with the full command is then output. So if it fails, I can go back to that log and see what the FFmpeg command is that was used and then run it manually myself and see where it may have failed. So we time then the actual Python subprocess call again um, to make the transcode to MP4. The finished file is checked with the media conch policy against an MP4 policy that we have and it's looking for a pass or a fail again. And then next, the JPEG image is created from within the actual MP4 transcoded file and not the original source file. Um, the adjust seconds um, uh, function is launched to attempt um, a few selections of a point in the MP4 stream. And the MP FFmpeg log logs and captures a red line by line to get that retrieve. Uh, black space information into the Python code. So when it selects one of many different options of potential second timings there, it checks that um, black space uh, information to make sure that it doesn't actually um, land on one of the black frames. Um, okay. So next, the get JPEG function is launched, which uses the seconds return from that adjust second um, to create a JPEG file using FFmpeg. And from this FFmpeg JPEG file, two JPEGs are created using open source software graphic magic through the command line. Um, this software allows image manipulation of the files so the JPEG can be resized to a standardized size for our thumbnails um, and for use in the DPI browser. That's the function there. And then when all the MPEGs and JPEGs are created successfully, the extensions are removed in this little bit of code here, um, which is a necessity for the, how we've got our image viewers configured. So finally, any, any images that make it into the transco folder are measured into four groups. So this is just uh, TIFF files, for example, through our, our documents teams. Um, if they're between one and 100 and 200 megabytes, then they're reduced to 75% of their original size for a JPEG uh, proxy image. If it's 200 to 300, it's 60% and up to 30% of its original size for an over 400 megabit file. Um, again, this is completed using graphics magic um, command line tool, using the same functions for the resizing for the thumbnails. Um, the JPEG files are checked for um, their paths and the JPEGs removed again. And then when all of these proxy files have been created, the SID media record is updated from this Python script. 
um, with the path with the file names of the, of the proxy files that have been created, and that makes them available in the DPI browser for viewing. So um, that's really all of the new Python scripts for the Imogen replacement. Hope it wasn't too confusing. There's a lot of data there. I appreciate that. Um, what we have next is a really quick look because we're running we're out of time. Just to look at the DPI downloader. Um, so here's a group of, uh, so this is how my Flask um, DPI downloader looks at the moment while it's still operational. We've got two versions in our repository. One uses the SQLite MySQL database and one uses the Elasticsearch. They're both still available to view in the, in the repository. Um, they both work exactly the same way, except they just look up the information collected from the web app in slightly different ways. Um, the downloader allows users to select a path to download to, a type of download, which is either a single or a bulk download, and also gives a few limited transcode features. So it will transcode to ProRes, to MP4 access copy, um, or MP4 with a watermark, or it will also create a proxy file for, for viewing in the DPI browser. The DPI downloader, which is still in final stages of production, has now integrated this. Um, it's removed the need for the Flask app that I created, and it's integrated it into their own DPI browser viewer. Um, but all the Python code is still operating in the same way. It provides us with auth authentication access, which wasn't easy to implement in the existing tool that we'd built ourselves because we um, don't have that skill set within our team at the moment. Um, and all of the Python code for the Blackpool downloader and the ProRes transcoding, MP4 transcoding, is available on the repository as well. So do please take a look. And a final page, just a sincere thanks to these, these pieces of software that made all of this scripting possible. Um, Python, FFmpeg, New Parallel, VLC, Media Info, Media Conch, uh, MKV Toolnix, which I didn't actually get a chance to talk about, but we do manipulate contents of an MKV wrapper with that software in the automation processes. Uh, Linux, obviously, raw cooked and graphic magics. And also a massive thanks to that team in that photo there. That's no time to wait, I think, six or five, many of whom build these things and support us in using them. So thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, I'm a little bit late there. Questions? Hello, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. A quick question about this Netflix file. Could you share more about its like, you know, considerations and challenges in ingesting this particular format file? Sure, I can do my best. I think my colleague Lucy might be better for this one. Was that? No, she's saying no. Okay. Well, there is an automation that I've built which I can talk about. So in the interoperable media format, packages that we're receiving. We're getting MXF wrapped uh, video files separately supplied to MXF wrapped audio files separately to um, XML files, which I believe in the XML files we have like a packing list, we have an asset map, and we have um, a, a third um, XML which has all of the information for the full package in there. Um, CPL, thank you. Um, what we're having to do is to automate um, the way we integrate those into the scripts. So the MXF files, we're not transcoding any kind of um, proxy images for those. Um, we are making sure that they're all linked on one item record in our digital media um, database, um, sorry. Uh, but they all have their own SID digital media kind of um, record. So they all link back to the item record, all items in there. So we're having to automate the way we name them so that they all have the part holes for the one IMP package, but they're actually all ingested as separate items into our workflows, if that makes sense. Um, it is the first IMP I think we've had to deal with, so it's been a really interesting learning curve, but it's, it's, we've got the automations in place now and they're available to view on the repository if you want to know a bit more. I think we had a remote question, but it was one I missed from the first part of your presentation. All right, <clears throat> so can you tell us a bit about your comparison process for deciding on the CRF level 28 in your FFE1 to H264 transcode process? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was informed by research um, where I found a number of people saying that CF, CRF 28 was one of the very highest settings you could have before the um, compression was actually visually obvious. So we ran a few tests across a few different um, CRF settings and 28 on the number of examples that we looked at didn't actually seem to be any visually different to any of the earlier CRF numbers. Um, and it wasn't a, a long and detailed process of, of, of um, research. I think we opted for it because visually we couldn't see any difference, but we knew that we'd be saving a lot of file sizes. Um, and when you've got, say, a few hundred thousand files being created as MP4s and stored in a QNAP server, that size difference is quite useful. Um, it's only an access copy for people to view so they can still access and download the original file if they want more detail and more information from the files. Thank you. Um, not a question, but just to flag that Joanna actually deserves a lot more credit because Imogen actually went away in March 22, not 21. So just the fact that <laughs> so just the fact that you've implemented all of this and the decision was quite late in the day to not continue with Imogen and as you can as you've probably heard we create a lot of data every day and we couldn't just let it sit there not ingesting so the fact that you created all of these applications and scripts in such a short timeline is just phenomenal so you deserve even more credit, so thank you. That's very kind of you. Sorry, that, that my not getting the date correct is probably <laughs> indicative of the chaos <laughs> in some of the workflows that we have going on at the minute. Um, just to say about the repository, um, it's kind of a work in progress. As Lucy's pointed out, we've just come out of a very intense kind of script creation period. It's now a little bit quieter, and I'm hoping that in the near future, new tests are going to be implemented for the scripting because there's no testing um, infrastructure at the moment um, and that there'll be refactoring work going on and that the intention is to move it into an airflow workflow. Airflow is like um, a workflow management system which schedules your um, processes for you instead of using Crontab but then also provides like a web GUI front end. So from this point forward, hopefully there'll be more tidying up of the code base, but I still feel it's valuable to share it as it exists now, because at the moment it's a better learning tool, I think, for new developers than when we've, say, in, built it into an Airflow environment. Thank you, Lucy, that's very kind of you. Any more? It is time for lunch, okay. Um, and I'll say there, there's some glassware outside, but it's for the three o'clock break. Uh, lunch is on your own. Um, there'll be two workshops at 2 o'clock, one for Media Info, Media Conch of Jerome, and then I'll be in here doing a live stream uh, workshop of group projects. In the program, it listed a tour at 4 o'clock, but unfortunately there will be no tour because you've already, walking in here, seen pretty much the entire space. Um, so we'll see you back here at 2 after lunch. Thank you, Joanna, so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.